Um, today, uh, we finish up our three-week series on money. Um, a series all about how we as Christ followers should be viewing and handling our finances and our possessions. And I do, I, I reckon that this has been a, a pretty convicting series for, for most of us, if not, if not all of us. Because we do, as Christ followers, we love our money, we, we love our possessions. But if you think back to me two weeks ago when we started this series, we were looking at the, the parable of the rich fool. Last week, we looked at the story of the rich ruler, and today we're going to be looking at another guy, another rich individual whose name is Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. And all of these texts that we've looked at throughout this series have come from the Gospel of Luke. And I've done that on purpose because I want us to notice something. Luke chapter 12, again, the first week of the series, we looked at a guy who's not named. We just know him to be the rich fool because he has this abundant harvest and God has provided so much for him, but instead of being rich towards God, he, he, he goes and builds bigger barns and, and keeps for himself, being rich towards himself and, and not God. And Jesus comes at the end and he says, you fool. He has no name. In Luke chapter 16, it's a text that we didn't go through. We didn't work through this, this series, but it's the story of a rich man and a guy named Lazarus. And Lazarus, he's very poor, and he sits at the outside of the gate of, of the rich man's home, and every day the rich man passes him by, and, and the dogs, they come out and they, they lick Lazarus' sores. He's, he's considered to be even beneath the dogs. But what ends up happening is they both end up passing away, and Lazarus ends up going to essentially heaven, and the rich man goes to essentially hell, right? Eternal torment. But he has no name. Lazarus has a name, but the rich man has no name. And then last week, we looked at the story of uh, the rich ruler. And this young man, he comes up to Jesus and asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, do the commandments. And well, I have. I've done everything. I'm righteous. I'm amazing. And Jesus goes, well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure how well you do with the first one, right? You shall have no other gods before me. So let's put that to the test. Go. Sell everything you own. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And the ruler walks away sad. But again, notice he doesn't have a name either. He's just known as the rich ruler. We go from story of no name, no name, no name. But then in Luke chapter 19, it's the last story in Luke's gospel about a rich guy. We get a story of a rich tax collector who is named. His name is Zacchaeus. It's almost like Luke is, is saying, if you want the big picture of, of how we as Christ followers should be viewing and, and handling our finances as, as Christ followers, the people who will be remembered will be the ones who do with their finances and their possessions like this Zacchaeus guy. You want a name? You want to be remembered? Take note of this guy Zacchaeus. Which begs the question, who is Zacchaeus? What has he done and what is he like? Well, this is his story. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And what I'd like to do for us today is I'd like to work through this text together. Uh, we'll work through it fairly quick, but get an idea of what's going on. And then I have one point today, only one single takeaway for us this morning. And then I have four illustrations from the Bible to kind of highlight the importance of, of this point. So the story, the point, and then four illustrations. We're going to go to the text. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. So Jericho is at the bottom of the hill that would lead up to Jerusalem. And it was a well-traveled town. Remember the story of the, the Good Samaritan. It happened on this road from Jerusalem coming down to Jericho. And it would have been a well-traveled town for Jews to, to go to and from the temple because no one wanted to go through the north. No one wanted to go through the north, which was Samaria, because the Samaritans in the, the eyes of the Jews, they were awful people. They were the half-breeds. So if you were a religious Jew and you wanted to make your sacrifices at the temple, you were going to be going through Jericho. And that's important, and we'll get there in a minute. But in verse 2, it says, A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. And the thing that we need to know about Zacchaeus 
is that he was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. And he was wealthy because he was a chief tax collector. Because here's how, here's how things worked, all right? The Romans, they, they came in and they, they took over the land. They, they occupied the land. And, and this Roman occupancy, it, was, it wasn't something that the Jews really uh, took a liking to. But, but, the, but the Romans, what, how they would govern is they would, they would find locals, local Jews, to, to kind of go out and perform and, and, and do their duties. Right? So it would be like if the Canadians, I know this is going to be a stretch, but just picture with me, all right? It would be like if the Canadians they came in and they took over America. And they said, in order to keep the peace, would you Americans be willing to collect the taxes for us so it doesn't look like we're the bad guys? And it sounds crazy, again, not because of the Canadian thing, but it sounds crazy, but there would be people, and there were Jews, who thought, seems like a good way to get rich. I'd be treated a little bit better than the other Jews, so yeah, I'll do it. That was Zacchaeus. He's one of the Jews that said he'd be willing to collect the taxes on behalf of the Romans. But, but not only that, he was going to upcharge a little bit because how, how else is he going to get rich? He needs his share. But then the text tells us that he's the chief tax collector. So he has people who are working under him. He's got this pyramid scheme going where he's taking some of their shares too. And then not only that, but because Jericho is such a well-traveled town, one of the largest taxes that one could collect is the traveling tax, based on how much you were carrying. And if you were a Jew coming through Jericho to make your sacrifices at the temple, you were always carrying a lot. So I don't know anyone richer than the chief tax collector in Jericho. Filthy, stinking rich but benefiting off the oppression of the people, your fellow Jews, you're overcharging him. That was Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector, and because of what he did, he was very rich. And then in verse 3, it says, he, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was. Because why wouldn't you? You're hearing all of his teachings, you're hearing of, of, of his message, and you're hearing of his, the healings and the miracles that he's performing. You're hearing that he's hanging out with sinners, including tax collectors. So if you're a tax collector and no one really wants to hang out with you, why wouldn't you want to see this Jesus guy? But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Because, people had, or because Jesus had people around him all the time. Thousands of people gathering around Jesus to, to see him and to, to hear him and to, to witness his miracles, which made it very difficult for Zacchaeus to see him because he was short. And I have no doubt in my mind that he probably tried to wiggle his way up to the front. You know, short people, one of the benefits to being short is you can kind of wiggle your way through crowds a little bit easier. But he's not very well liked, so there was no way the crowd was going to let him to the front. So, he ran up ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree since Jesus was coming that way. Sycamore fig tree, a great tree for climbing, all right? It has good thick branches. It can support your weight. It's not too tall, so don't picture this big old tree, right? Jesus isn't way up in the air. He's likely just kind of, or Zacchaeus is not just way up in the air. He, he's likely just above the heads of, of the crowd, but what I think we fail to recognize in, in our culture is just how gasp-worthy this moment is. What Zacchaeus is doing is insane. This is crazy. In the ancient world, rich men do not run to anybody. They run to you. In the, or in the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, the, the father, he runs to the son. That's insane. You don't do that. You're the rich dad. You're the landowner. They run to you. In our culture, the rich, important people, they don't run to anyone. The crowds flock to them. But here we have Zacchaeus. Rich, important Zacchaeus running up ahead climbing up a tree to see Jesus. And even though the people don't like him, it's like, what are you doing? You don't do this, Zacchaeus. Verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, 
he looked up and said to him, and I, we know what he's going to say to him, what are you doing up there, you disgusting sinner? Right? He's going to condemn him for all, for all the evil things that he's done. But he says, Zacchaeus, Jesus already knows his name, Zacchaeus. Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. You invite people over to your house, or you offer to go over to their house when you're saying, we're buds. We're going to be friends. So Jesus invites himself over as a way of saying, hey, you tax collector, hey, you sinner, hey, you person who, who no one likes, who everyone despises, I'm coming to your house today. We're going we're gonna to be friends. We're going to hang out. So Zacchaeus, he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Oh, I bet he did. I can't believe he's even talking to me. And then all the people saw this and they began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner? Like, wait, what? Jesus, do you, what are you doing? Do you, know, do you know who this guy is? Do you know what he's done? He's a tax collector. He's awful. They're shocked. They're upset, as you'd expect. You know, sometimes I think, you know, there's this song. There's this song that the kids sing. Perhaps you know it. I actually don't know the words. Um, I didn't grow up with it, but I have a general idea. It's like, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, and something about wanting to see Jesus and being in a tree, and, you know, I didn't look it up. You would have thought I looked up the lyrics before. But like, hey, you know, come down. We're going to your house, you know, and it's, it's this jolly, jo yeah, something, you know the words, all right. It's this jolly little tune that is crazy because it in no way captures just how insane this moment is. Zacchaeus, he, he's not this cute little man, right? He is wicked. He is an oppressor of the people. He is despised by everyone. He is wicked. If there's anyone in this crowd who does not deserve to see Jesus, it is him. But hey, man, get down here. We're going to hang out at your house today absolutely crazy, but what we have here is an amazing act of grace from Jesus, and a man who deserves nothing is somehow, some way, welcomed by God himself. So what does he do? Verse 8 says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. That's a lot. Right? For us, that's like if we have two cars, you give away one. You have two homes, you give away one. You have ten shirts, you give away five. You give half of everything that you own. Zacchaeus is very wealthy. He's giving away a ton. And it says, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, and oh, you have, buddy, I will pay back four times the amount. That is a remarkable response. And Jesus said to him, today... Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Now Jesus, what he's not saying here is, whoa, because of that really cool thing you did there, I'm going to give you salvation because you've earned it. Okay, that's not what he's saying. What Jesus is saying here is, I see salvation has come to you because of what you've just done in response to it. Right? I, I know the gospel has hit you because of the fruit that, it, that it's bore and what you've done with your, with your possessions and your finances in response. Today, Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your home. And then verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, even the rich ones. For remember from last week, what's impossible with man is possible with God. It's a great little story the story of Zacchaeus, and it's like Luke is writing at the end of his gospel, look, I've given you all of these negative stories about how to, to handle your finances and your possessions. Right? The, the, the rich fool, the, the rich man and, and Lazarus, the, the rich ruler. Well, now we're coming to, to the end of the gospel. Let me give you the right way. Let me give you a positive example. Let me tell you about Zacchaeus who responded to the grace of Jesus with this transformed view of his money and his possessions. You know, I believe our, our, our generosity towards others 
It's going to rise and it's going to fall based largely on the sense of God's generosity towards us. When we understand just how magnificent the works of Jesus did for us, then our response and generosity towards others, it grows. So if you want to, to, to grow in your generosity, if you want to be rich towards God, the, the, the trick is not to bully yourself into thinking, ugh, i got to do this. God, you're telling me to do this. Oh, I guess I should. It's probably the right thing to do. No, it's to delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is my one and only takeaway that I have for us. Delight in the gospel of Jesus. It transforms everything. But how often do we take time to delight in the gospel of Jesus? That's my one takeaway. Let me give you four examples in Scripture that kind of highlight just how important uh, this, this, this point is, what it looks like to delight in the gospel. I'm going to start with a negative example. The text that we looked at from last week, Luke chapter 18, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one's good except God alone. Well, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Well, all of these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. Like, like if there's a person who is righteous enough, if there's anyone who deserves it, it's me. I've kept the Ten Commandments. Check. But when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Right again, like I'm not so sure you've kept the first commandment. Right? No other gods before me. So again, we're going to put this to the test. Sell everything you own. Give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. It says, when he heard this, he became very sad. Why, you sad man? Because he was very wealthy. He was very wealthy. What Jesus says to this guy who, who thinks he's righteous, what, what he thinks when he hears this is, man, man, you're going to make me do this? This, this duty? Because my whole life, I, I've been doing the rules. I've been, I've been following the Ten Commandments. I've been doing this duty. I've been, I've been trying to figure out how I can honor God through, through, through these works. I tithe the right amount. I'm, not, I'm righteous. I'm not like this, this tax collector. I do, and I say all the right things. And Jesus is like, well, one more thing. Sell your stuff. Give it to the poor. Come, follow me. And he's like, no. Anything but that. And he doesn't do it. And he goes away sad. Because to him, it's just a duty. There is no delight. And there's no delight because he doesn't recognize the grace that he has received, the grace that he needs. He has a muted, small understanding of the grace that he's received and it's led to a small, muted, minuscule, sad understanding in response to that grace. There's no delight, just duty. Do this. Ugh. The second example, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. It says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne. So Isaiah, he's having this vision. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. Two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth is full of His glory. This is what the angels are saying for all of eternity, because it's never enough. He's that holy. And it says, At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Like, I can't stand here morally impure before a morally pure, good, sovereign, powerful Lord. I want to melt away. I want to disappear. I feel, I feel so disgusting. Woe to me, he says. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. We call that grace. 
Isaiah doesn't deserve any of it, and he knows it. He's a wicked man, unclean lips, and yet God dis- decides to, to show him grace so we can join in on the praise. And it says, Then I heard this vo- the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah, who's been standing here this whole time thinking there's no way I could possibly praise God because if I have unclean lips, if it comes through me, it's just going to come out ruined. The first thing he says after he's received this grace is, Here I am. Send me, pick me, choose me, I'll go. Isaiah, do you even know the mission? Doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. Send me. I don't care. Someone who sees the glory of God and and sees this gap of the forgiveness that has been given to you, is there anything too much to ask? Take me. I'll go. There's no duty in Isaiah's response. There's no, okay, I guess, you know, if someone has to go, I'll do it if I have to. No, it's take me. I have a chance to do this. I'll do anything. Example three, the story of the Apostle Paul. He's trying to reach people with the gospel, and he enters into this town of Philippi. And it says, on the Sabbath, he went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. So, so they're, they're outside the city, they're at the river, they, they meet these women. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia a dealer in purple cloth. So purple cloth is like the the color of royalty, right? Normal people don't wear purple. It's it's meant for for kings and queens and and royal people. So she's this high-end fashion designer, probably getting paid pretty well. And it says she was a worshiper of God, meaning she wasn't Jewish. She was a Gentile on on, on the edge of the Jewish community. She's very much interested in this God of Israel. And then Paul, he's going to start speaking, and it says the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. In other words, she came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and she could not resist the goodness of the gospel and the love of Jesus. And then in verse 15, it says, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come, stay at my house. And she persuaded us. The English text here, the translation, does not do this text justice. He, Lydia, is urging them, please, come, stay at my house. Paul and Silas, they're like, no, no, you know, Lydia, it's it's okay. Trust me. No, it's really, no, please. The, The doors are open for you. I have all of this stuff. Come, take it. It's yours. It's no burden at all. Please. There's no duty at all in her response. It is pure delight. The gospel has hit her And now there's nothing too much to ask. It's all yours. How can I begin to worship the Lord? I have all of this stuff. Take it, Lord. Take it. I'll do whatever. I'll use that, she says. And then my final example is Luke chapter 7. It's one of my favorite texts in the whole Bible. Luke 7, 36 to 48 says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table which is how they sat back in the day, right? They didn't have chairs, so they're kind of leaning up on one arm and their, their feet are kind of behind them. It says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, and you can probably guess what that means, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. This was an only guys event, right? This was not something that the women would have been invited to back in the day, especially the women who are, who are living this, this kind of sinful life with their hair kind of being all crazy and whatever. But she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Do you know how much that costs? This is, this is what she uses to make a living. This is, this is a year's worth of salary. This is the most expensive thing she owns. And it says, as she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she, she's ugly crying, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Right, that's how many tears there were. That she's able to clean the feet of Jesus who has been walking around the town in his sandals. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Outrageous act of worship towards Jesus. People didn't do this to him. And then verse 39 says, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, No, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Right? He's thinking to himself, Jesus, you're kind of guilty by association. 
holy men do not mess with women like this. But then Jesus answered him, which is funny because no one asked Jesus a question, but he's like, you know, I have a, I have a thought to that. I have, a, I have a response to that ridiculous thought you just thought there. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Say two people owed money to a certain money lender. One, o- one owed him 500 denarii. So a denarii is a day's wages. So 500 days wages and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Like if I showed up to your house today, I was like, look, I have two of your bills, and I'm going to pay off both of them. Yeah, yeah. And the first one is the, the bill that you collected, I don't know, at the post office, right? $10 for some stamps. I'm going to pay it off. You'd be like, wow, <laughs> thanks, I guess. Why are you here? <laughs> like, get off my lawn. But the other bill is your mortgage. I'm going to pay off your mortgage. You'd be like, oh, <laughs> honored pastor, come on in, right? We're having steaks for dinner, whatever you want. You can join us. That's what he's saying. Which one of them is going to love him more? Simon replies, I suppose the one with the bigger debt forgiven, the 500 denarii guy, obviously. Jesus is like, you've judged correctly. But then look at this. It says, then he turned. Jesus, he turns toward the woman, but says to Simon. So he's looking at the woman, Simon's over here. He says, do you see this woman? Simon's probably thinking, yes, we all see this woman. That's the problem. I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet. The basic hospitality thing. You couldn't even do that. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, right? You didn't welcome me with warmth. But this woman from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, cheap oil as a welcome. You couldn't even do that. But she has poured perfume on my feet, again, the most expensive thing she owns. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as great as her great love has shown. I can tell that her sins are forgiven because the way that she's worshiping it's the fruit of, the, of what's gone on in her heart. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. That's you, Simon. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Our generosity towards others will rise and fall based largely on the sense of God's generosity towards us. And I believe the church today And I don't mean just in spirit. I mean the church, the capital C church, the global church is so muted in its worship. And I don't mean just singing because the gospel in our hearts is so little. I think we've deserved it. We we think we've earned it. We, we, We act like the rich ruler. We act like Simon, but we're not. We're this lady. We're Zacchaeus. We don't deserve the grace of God. We never did. We never will. God doesn't look upon us and think, if only I could just have that person on my team, then we'd win. No. He has shown us, you, me, all of us, remarkable, magnificent grace. And when we begin to realize just how big that grace is, our worship of Him gets bigger. And you'll look around and think, how can I even begin to repay you, Lord? I have all of this stuff. Everything I have has been given to me. It's yours, Lord. Whatever you want, I'll do it. You know, the Apostle Paul, he has so many opportunities to to write in his letters, to to give money and, and appeal to the law, but he never does. He never says you need to give money because that's what the law says. He goes, you're not giving any money? Let me tell you about the gospel. Let me pray for you so that you would come to know just how big, how wide, how, how large, how expansive, how deep the love of Jesus is for you. Let me pray for you so that your hearts would be full with the fullness of God. My brothers and sisters, in spirit, the grace of Jesus is for you. It's for you. And what a beautiful opportunity 
to celebrate that goodness and that grace and to prepare our hearts to take communion together. You know, the, these, past few, these past few weeks, we've talked a lot about our money and, and our possessions. And again, I, I know this has been a, a pretty difficult series for all of us because we do. We love our money. We love, we love our things. We love our stuff. And we fall short of, of what God desires for us every single day. No matter how hard we try, we are going to fall short of what God desires for our lives. And truthfully, we know we do. When it comes to our money and our possessions, we make excuses for it. We try and minimize it, but it goes beyond just our money and our, and our possessions. It's in how we talk. It's in how we, we think of others. It's in how we spend our time. It's in how we spend our energy. It's in everything. Everything that we do is tainted with sin, yet God still chooses to save. And God, our loving God, still chooses to lavish upon us his love and his mercy and his grace. So in communion today, we're welcome to the table. He welcomes you to his table, all those who put their faith in him to be the Lord and Savior. You are welcome to his table as we remember the goodness and the grace of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Again, for what you've done and how you've spoken to us in this this series, this, this tough series on money and possessions. Again, Lord, we know, we, we know that we fall short of, of what you would desire for us and how we spend our, our money and our, our resources. So, Lord, may all of this point us back to you, the God who is in control, the God who loves us, the God who chooses us, even when we don't deserve it. God, may we look to you and, 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 and give to you, begin to, to recognize the grace that we've received. May we take time as, as Christ followers, as a church, to, to remember all that you've done for us, Lord. And it's in those moments where we remember everything that you've done for us, Lord. You've given us so much. You have forgiven us of the many sins. You have pulled us out of, out of the depths of hell so that we could have eternal life with you. How could we ever begin to repay you, Lord? We have all of this stuff. Lord, by the power of your Spirit, may we do that together as the church family that you've called us to be a part of. We love you. We thank you for your word, and we're thankful as we prepare our hearts for communion today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.